Thank you, Olivier. Thank you, Isabel, for uh, your two insightful presentation on two very different security changes, one on food and the other one on, uh, on power, <coughs> on electricity. So I open the floor now for questions. Oui? Uh, I had a question relation, relating to the very remarkable presentation made on food. Uh, you explained very well how one could give enough food to eliminate hunger. You did not address very much the issue of the impact of agriculture on climate change. I mean, as far as I know, it represents about 20% presently of uh, greenhouse gases. Yeah, yeah, that's a This percentage should increase over time specifically if meat consumption increases, which seems a trend. And so I would be interested by your thoughts on this issue. Yes, I mean, I didn't deal with it because, you know, I can't, it's not possible to deal with the whole thing. But it's a really very important question. It's true agriculture contributes to greenhouse gases. And there's a whole literature on changing. There are uh, techniques for changing to making agriculture, you know, uh, climate neutral. But the key thing there is it requires an enormous investment of research and in particular extension to these millions of, of, of farmers. So I mean, you don't want me to go, I mean, there are so many ways of, of doing it, but none of them are easy, really. They are all knowledge intensive. You really have to know your soils. You have to invest in it. It's not like just throw some seeds in and, you know, I just hope for the best. No. The, I mean, soil fertility and soil degradation is a huge problem. And when agriculture is non-productive, people then try to expand the land and cut down forests. You see, I know there's a big debate about GMOs, you know, I mean, simply put, the Americans are for it, the Europeans are against it. I mean, there are probably a nuances somewhere. But if you look at only the land savings from GMOs, it's dramatic. It's really dramatic. So, you know, you have to decide what is important because if land and forests are important and you want productivity increase, you should look at GMOs. And I like your approach. I mean, there is a lot of information that is required about, I've looked at a lot of surveys of consumer uh, uh, response to GMOs, both in Europe and in China and in the US. Number one, most people don't really know what is involved. I mean, it's a complicated thing. You know, as you say, information is critical. A lot of them get them like, oh, well, you know, uh, some people are anti-science, so it's... So what the surveyors point out is a lot of the resistance to GMOs is based on non-information or misinformation. It's, you know, the same thing we have with this COVID-19. You know, people are against vaccine for, I don't know what, they'll become this, they'll become that. Obviously, I'm not sympathetic with it, but it does show the world is becoming so complicated, people need to know, we need to inform them. So to answer your question, yes, agriculture does contribute to warming the climate, especially livestock, and so some people say the way to do it is everybody become vegetarian. I mean, this is easier said than done, you know? I mean, India is mainly vegetarian. Does it, it doesn't have a problem of climate change? I mean, so the, 
the, the point is we're getting into a world there's no like single silver bullet. Only do this and the world will be fine. You, like Peter Timmer shows and like all research shows, you need so many things to line up. And that's the difficulty we, we face. We need a lot of information. We need collaboration. We need people to understand. You need people to work together. Sometimes, frankly, I am a little pessimistic whether we can make it. The way we are going it requires, so that really, I mean, from an economist point of view, the way we look at it, we need to have incentives for people to do. You're not going to command people to behave properly. That just doesn't work, even if you're authoritarian. I mean, I looked at the survey in China on GMOs. China is very pro-GMO because it's a land-scarce economy, and it believes in science. So the government has invested a lot. But guess what? When it comes to survey, a lot of people are against it. So what do they do? You see, they did not make the effort to explain to people, to get people adherences like, do it, because I tell you so. Well, you know, people will buy what they want to buy. You, you cannot force them. But that is just one instance of changing the technology to be climate compliant or climate friendly or climate resilient. And we didn't talk about the problems of climate change, you know, all the, the floods and the droughts and the landslides, which is really emphasize the technology transfer is critical. But technology transfer is not in a vacuum. People are starving. They don't care about climate change. They're going to die tomorrow. Well, what's the problem with climate change? That's, you know, 10 years from now, I'm dead already. So, you know, now we are faced with these really what's called wicked problems. We are, we've been pushed in a world in which things are becoming more and more complicated and people are getting more and more assertive, rightly so. It's not a matter of blaming people, rightly so. So, you know, if we want to do something, we really have to relook our incentive system. Incentives do work. We know everybody wants to be better off. It's, it doesn't matter what religion you are, whether you're a man or a woman or whatever, everybody wants to be well off, better off. I mean, the poor are the first people who really want to be well off. Give them the incentives, and then give them the tools to help themselves. Because now once you talk about that, you see it's an expansion of government now. Education, health, you know, public goods, global public goods. You know, before the pandemic, we talk of national public good. Now you have to talk about global public goods. So, Really, if we're going to change just agriculture, not talking about energy, which is another big issue. I mean, electricity is another big issue. I mean, we're faced with only big issues now. There's no kind of simple things left to do. Thank you. If we have to do that, we really have to relook our institutions. I mean, sometimes crises are actually great times because people will change. Because they know they have to change. I'm shutting up. Yeah, he's excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to add something. I think what's, it's really important that we look at ourselves. <clears throat> I think, you know, it's very easy to say, you know, we need to do this, we need to do this. But I often say, what are we actually doing at home? Mm. Maybe we should think of reducing how much meat we're eating, how much dairy products we're eating. Maybe we should look at portion size again. Maybe we should... L Make sure no edible food goes into the waste bin. I, I, I tell people always, actually, it starts with us. 
we are the pullers of these food systems at the end of the day. And it's, it's very easy to, to, to think you are far away from it when actually you are part of it. It's actually a personal thing now. And I think each and every one of us need to take that time. And I think a lot of us have during COVID. Many of us have changed our habits. Many of us started actually growing foods at home. Uh, many of us started thinking a little bit more about what we're spending, how much we're spending on food. I mean, I was eating out a lot before, but now actually we've started to do a lot more home cooking. Um, I've started, because myself, I'm always talking about food loss and food waste. I said, you know what? I need to check at home how much food is ending up in, in the bin. Yeah, And I think each and every one of us have need to take that responsibility and it kind of will cascade because our kids will, will be influenced by it. Their friends will be influenced by it. I mean, how many kids now come home and say, actually, this is not good and this is not good? Because they are also looking at it from school. So uh, I just wanted to add that point that this is a personal thing now as well. Thank you. Very useful. A question at the back. I have a question on the electricity. If I may come back to that, all right. I mean, the presentation of these facts leave only one conclusion, that Europe is going with an open eye into a period of blackouts, right? You have pointed out possible countermeasures, but my question to you is, where are we on the countermeasures? Perhaps Peter Handley can help us what the European Union is doing, but this is a rather depressing picture that you've painted. Uh. Uh, as I explained, it's a challenge in Europe. In fact, in Europe, there was no problem because uh, there was a surplus of capacity. And uh, that's why in uh, 20 years, uh, with uh, the opening of the market, the price dropped because there was a surplus of capacity. But unfortunately, as I explained, uh, this surplus of capacity has been weakening and uh, the capacity, the dispatchable capacity has been replaced by, term, by renewable energy, which are intermittent and difficult uh, to dispatch, in fact. Uh, so, and, but this situation is not unique in, uh, in Europe, as I explained by, with the slide of the IEA. It is a concern all around the world. There are some solutions. In fact, there has been in France a study made by the French TSO with the IEA how to deal in uh, 2050 with uh, um, a, a, a power mix only with renewable. Uh, in fact, it's possible, but the conditions are so drastic that it seems rather unrealistic. So there are different solutions. I listed this solution. Anyway, there are uncertainties because the technologies are not available. Some technologies are not available and are still on, under development. But anyway, it's very expensive. Just I take an example. Uh, I was told by the president of the French regulator that just for the transmission network, and the distribution network, the investment uh, related to the change represent around 100 billion uh, euros for the next 10 years. So, technology can do anything, but we need to have a business model, and it's absolutely monetary to have also a price signal. The industry may invest in the new technologies in order new flexible technologies, but they need to invest for the decades to come and they want to know what will be the general framework of the electricity system and energy system in the next uh, two or three decades. And it is not the case because the market is only a short-term market and gives the price for today and tomorrow. Thank you, Olivier and Isabel. So I, I, I think Peter would like to, to contribute, but I, if I may suggest for the sake of time that uh, you, you go ahead with your presentation uh, and, and maybe complement uh, and that opportunity what has just been discussed on electricity uh, shortage uh, or reliability supply, in fact, and, and then uh, uh, Marc-Antoine, if you want to, to comment, and we'll try to wrap up with the, the, the Q&A sessions. <laughs>